Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to Second. We're so glad that you chose to come and worship with us today, whether you're here in person or you're checking us out online. We're so glad you've joined us. Now, I know it's a little bit strange doing the preaching portion, at least for those in the room. I know it's kind of weird for us to do this pre-recorded or via a video, and I want you to know it's weird for you, and it's also a little bit strange for us, uh, but, but actually we, we did this because we, we weren't planning on doing this. However, we found out yesterday that our senior pastor, Tommy, uh, tested positive for COVID, and, and Tommy was planning on preaching, uh, but because he tested positive for COVID, he was kind of out of it. And then also, uh, because I was around him, uh, I was potentially exposed to COVID. And so we as your pastors, we, we believe that it's our duty to keep you safe. And so because of that, we pre-recorded this sermon actually on Saturday night uh, to bring it to you today. And so we're so excited that we get to preach, or that I get to preach to you today. We're so excited for this message. And actually today, I get the pleasure of kicking Kicking off a new series. It's a neighboring series that's going to be all about, man, what does it look like for us to love those around us? Now, I wonder for you, I wonder whenever you hear the concept of neighboring, I wonder what you think of. I, I bet some, some that are watching right now, you're thinking of coming home and putting on a red cardigan and singing, wouldn't you be my neighbor? Just just like the good old TV show did. Or, or maybe you are right now thinking about a neighbor that you've had, be it a mean neighbor, an awful neighbor that you had a really, really bad experience with, or a great neighbor that you loved and you had great conversations with, or maybe it was a strange neighbor that did things that you still don't know what was going on at their house. But here's one thing I know about you and, and everyone that's watching, it's this. I know that you have a neighbor whether, whether your neighbor is an acre away or maybe you live in apartment 10B, wherever you live, you have a neighbor. And so here's the question that I want to ask today, and here's the question that I want to answer. It's this, who is your neighbor or, or who is my neighbor? What does it look like for me to neighbor? Now, when I say that, I mean that in a couple of different ways. I do fully intend on the people that you live geographically closest to. And so I wonder for you, just take a second and think in your mind, I wonder how many of you know who your immediate neighbors are, like who lives on your right and your left and across the street from you. Or maybe do you know who lives two doors down and maybe even get bonus credit today if you know who lives three doors down because probably very few of us know who live three doors down. I, I, I do mean that when I'm talking about neighboring, but we're also going a step further when we're talking about neighboring. Who is your neighbor and not just who you live next to, but who would Jesus say that your neighbor is? How would Jesus define neighboring? To answer that question today, we're going to look at maybe the most famous passage of scripture in, about neighboring in all of the Bible. It's found in Luke chapter 10. And so as, you, as you're turning to Luke chapter 10, uh, we're turning to a passage of scripture today where, and it's, it's a place where we find ourselves pretty frequently where Jesus is actually being questioned by a teacher of the law. Now, Jesus had this happen quite often because to be totally honest, he spurned them quite often. They did not like Jesus. Jesus was kind of messing up the status quo. The religious elite were not fans of Jesus. And so they would try and send their most learned people, the smartest scholars that they had, to try and trick Jesus. And so I want you to see today in the scripture that we find in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, this scenario playing out all over again. Luke writes this. He says in Luke 10, 25, it says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Notice the question that this guy asks Jesus. He doesn't pull any punches. He goes for the biggest question of all time. The question that I'm sure you've wrestled with too, and it's this, what do we do about eternal life? If there really is a heaven and there really is a hell, how do we know that we get in? Jesus, what about eternal life. Notice how Jesus answers him in verse 26. He says this in, in Luke 10, 26. He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? 
Jesus begins answering this question by showing us that the place that we find eternal answers is not in the world. The place that we find eternal answers are in God's word. And the way that he points, or the place that he points this religious scholar to is not through some sort of pop psychology of the first century. No, he points him to God's word. He says, hey, what, what do you read in scripture? How do you interpret it? Look, look how he responds, continuing on in verse 27. It says that the scholar or the lawyer responds this way. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, this guy had this, this down pat. He knew exactly how he wanted to respond to Jesus before Jesus probably even answered the question. He knew how Jesus was going to come back to him. And so he had a plan for how he was going to come back to Jesus. And what we see here is he spouts off something that was just kind of Christianese, if you will. It was just something that sort of came off of his tongue, but probably hadn't yet made its way to his heart. And Jesus answers him and he says this in, in verse 28. He says to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Jesus says, yeah, you're right. You got the answer right. Go and do that and you'll be set to go. If you go and you love God and you go and you love people like you know you're supposed to love God and like you know you're supposed to love people, then you'll be set. You don't have to worry about eternal life. But you see, Jesus said this knowing that there's no way that he could do that. Knowing that that was the entire reason that Jesus came in the first place was because we couldn't successfully love God all the time with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our mind and all of our strength. Far too often we love ourselves or things that we can see. And, and to take that a step further, Jesus knew not only can we not love God like we're supposed to, there's no way we're going to love people like we love ourselves. There's no way that you are always going to love your residential neighbors like you love yourself. But to take that a step further, there's no way that you're going to love people that you come into contact with as much as you love you. You see, Jesus kind of answered this trick question with a trick question of his own. And you might think that that's where the story would kind of end, that this guy would realize that he was beaten by the omniscient one, even though he didn't fully believe yet that Jesus was omniscient. But the guy doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He continues on as sort of a way of justifying himself. And he says this in verse 29. It says, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See it? He said, who is my neighbor? Now, I don't want you to miss this. The whole reason that he continued on further and asked this question was because he was seeking self-justification. He was seeking to justify himself. And man, how often do we do the exact same thing? How often do we also seek to justify ourselves in front of other people? Like, Like maybe not overtly, maybe we don't say it, but maybe we think, Man, the reason why I sin is because of this. Or, man, I'm not as bad as they are. Or, man, if you only knew what they did, what I do, it's nowhere near what they did. And so in that way, I am justified in the same way as this guy does. We seek to justify ourselves. And what's so ironic about this passage of Scripture is it's so blatantly obvious that this guy is seeking justification and validation in himself all the while standing before the one who had come to give him freely justification and validation, the justification and validation that he needed. In fact, us today, can I just encourage you, man, you will not find justification in excuses or in doing good works or in multiplying good deeds. No, 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 friend. The only way that you will find justification is by faith and faith alone in Christ in Christ alone. And Jesus knew that. He, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? The same question that we're seeking to answer today, who is my neighbor? 
Now to answer this this question, Jesus goes in on a story and he begins telling a story, a parable. He did this often. Jesus would tell these short, memorable stories to kind of make a point in the ear and the mind and the heart of the listener. And so Jesus says, man, there, at one time there was this guy traveling back to uh, Jerusalem, or traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jesus said this guy was traveling uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and while he was on the path, he was attacked by robbers. And these robbers, they beat him, they stripped him naked, they took all of his valuables, and they left him for dead on the side of the road. It's a depressing story. You might be thinking, man, what does this have to do with neighboring? What, is, what, what does this have to do with being a neighbor? Jesus continues on, he says, and, and right after that, a priest came walking by. And as you're listening to the story, you might think, oh, that's, that's great news. This, this priest, man, he was the exact same religious persuasion as this guy was. In fact, he was probably going to temple and this guy was probably returning from temple. This is great. This is this guy's salvation. But as Jesus continues on in the story, he says, the priest just walked by the man and kept going on the road, leaving him helpless and hopeless. But he continues on, he says, not only did that happened, he said a little while later, a Levite came. Now, now you might not be familiar with what a Levite is. You might know a guy named Levi, but what, what is a Levite? The Levites were the priestly caste of the time. A Levite was the most religious. In fact, the high priest came from the Levitical tribe. The, the Levites were the holy of holies. They were the guys that knew God's word maybe better than anyone else. And Jesus said, in this moment, a Levite came walking by this guy. And again, as, as you're hearing the story, you're thinking, oh, that's great. That's good news. This guy's going to help this guy. He's going to, surely he knows to love God and love people. He's teaching other people to love God and love people. He should be the example of loving God and loving people. He's going to help this guy. But Jesus says he also walks by him and leaves him on the road. Again, helpless and hopeless. Man, it'd be miraculous for one guy to walk by at the right time. It'd be incredible for someone, for two people to walk by at the right time. But, but Jesus continues on the story and, and he goes this way. He says, and then came a Samaritan. Now I know for, for us listening today, that Samaritan word probably doesn't mean a lot to us. It's easy to read that and just sort of glance over that and not fully realize what Jesus is saying. But for the listeners of that time, this was huge. In fact, when Jesus used the word Samaritan, there was probably an audible gasp. <gasps> what? A Samaritan? Why is he bringing up a Samaritan? Because Jews and Samaritans had all kinds of hatred and hostility with one another. There was all kinds of ethnic controversy and even racism between Jews and Samaritans. They both looked upon one another with disdain. And Jesus brings this up. He interjects a Samaritan in the story to address issues that were going on in culture at the time to mess with people's theological boxes. And I just, I just wanna say this really quick. Christians, in the same way that Jesus was not afraid to address cultural issues at the time that were being brought up, that the gospel clearly spoke to, in the exact same way, Christians, we shouldn't avoid it either. In fact, that, that's why we often speak on social issues or cultural issues or things going on in our society, in our country. The reason why we speak to them is because Jesus spoke to them. And the reason, a secondary reason why we speak to them is because we have the answer the world's looking for. We know that the hope that everyone's looking for, the solution to every ism, whether it's racism or sexism or terror, whatever the ism is, the solution isn't found in politics. It's not found in throwing more more money at the problem. No, the solution is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, we know that the source of all of this brokenness and sin, and we know that the answer to sin was Jesus. And we agree with what Peter said in Acts 4.12, that there is no other name given by in heaven on earth by which we will be saved. Not only eternally saved, but also saved from ourselves here. So Christians, I just challenge you, in what ways do you need to allow the gospel to seep into your life to affect every single aspect of your being? 
And what do we as believers need to stand up for and speak out on? But as Jesus continues on the story, he says, a Samaritan walks up. And if there's anyone that should leave this guy alone, if there's anyone that shouldn't help this guy, man, it's that Samaritan. It's the Samaritan. They had conflict. He wouldn't stop for him. And if he did stop for him, even his friends might say, man, what were you doing? Why were you helping the enemy? Why would you do that? But Jesus says the Samaritan, he sees the guy in need. He has compassion and he serves him. He serves him in pretty profound ways. He serves him in ways that that actually cost him greatly. It says that he picked him up, he put him on his own animal, he, he bound up his wounds, he, he tried to help him out. Not only that, he took him to the next town over and he put him up in an inn. This, this, the text says that it cost two days worth of wages that he paid instantaneously. And not only that, the Samaritan said, hey, not only do I want you to take care of him, anything that he incurs, the bill that he incurs, I want to pick up the bill for that. See, the Samaritan cared for this man even when it cost him greatly. And then Jesus answers in in true Jesus form. He answers this question with the question in verse 36. Read with me here in verse 36. He says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among them? The robbers. Remember the first question was, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers by saying, well, who do you think was a neighbor to the man that was beat up on the side of the road? I wonder for you today, man, how, how would you answer? If Jesus was asking you today, if he said, man, which one of these was the right neighbor? Which one of these was the neighbor to that guy? You'd say, the Samaritan. Actually, the, the, the Samaritan was the neighbor. The, those other guys, even though they had everything in common, they, they weren't the neighbor to him. The Samaritan was. And Jesus closes this by saying this. He says, you are correct. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I mean, talk about a tough teaching. Jesus, Jesus does not kind of hint around truth. Jesus attacks us head on. And Jesus is dealing with hypocrisy and a religious guy. He's dealing with all kinds of racial hostility that was going on. Jesus is addressing so many issues, but maybe the most difficult thing that Jesus says in all of this is the very last thing that he says when he says, you go and do likewise. Because you see, Jesus wasn't just saying that to that young ruler, that, that, that lawyer. No, Jesus would say that to us today. And so I, I want to spend the rest of my time with you answer, or asking the question, what does it look like for us to go and do likewise? Who, who really is our neighbor and how can we make sure that we are being the neighbor that God has called us to be? I mean, truly, we're going to answer that the next three weeks, but, but today I want to look at Who is our neighbor and what does it look like for us to go and do likewise? The very first point I want you to see from Scripture, the very first question I want to give you to kind of help diagnose that is this. How big do you believe that God is? How big is God for you? I want you to think about that. How big do you truly believe God? that he is. If you read in your New Testament, you'll find that Jesus and and really every single New Testament author throughout the New Testament often combines the idea of loving God and loving people. They're very rarely ever separated. Even in every single letter, most of the times when Paul and Peter and James and John and Jude write letters to the churches, the first half deals with loving God, right theology. The second half deals with loving people. And so, what I, these two things are, are intrinsically woven together, and I want you to see this today, that you cannot love God and neglect people. But, but to even take that a step further, the scope of your neighboring will be totally determined by the size of your God. 
And here's what I mean by that. I don't mean that your house will be bigger and so you'll have more neighbors or anything like that. But what I mean is the bigger that you believe that God is, the more you'll begin to see him orchestrating all of your relationships around you. The more that you'll see him at work in the everyday, ordinary things of life. This last week, um, there was one night that my wife, Chris, and I, we, we were tired. It was later, and, and we decided instead of cooking that night, we were going to go out to eat. We are going to go pick up something and bring it home and eat it. And so we were debating, as I'm sure you do, every married couple does, for about 30 minutes. Well, what do we want to eat? What do you want? Well, what do you want? Well, I don't know. What do you want? That kind of a thing. And so we debated, and after about 30 minutes, we decided that she wanted to get some cheeseburgers from the special burger joint. I wanted a barbecue sandwich from this place. And so we ordered it, and I looked loaded up my two oldest kids, my three-year-old son and my one-year-old daughter, and we head over to the barbecue place. And I pick up my barbecue sandwich, and, and we have a good time there. And then, then we load up, and we head over to the burger place. And as we're walking in, this guy goes in front of us, and he's, he's picking up a to-go order as well. And as we're standing in line, we're behind him in line. He starts making conversation with me about my kids. And not only does he make conversation with me about my kids, he starts talking to them. And my kids are both extroverts, so they start babbling back at this guy. And, and after a little while, this guy that we've never met before bought both of my kids a milkshake. Even my one-year-old daughter bought both of my kids a milkshake. I'm thinking, thanks a lot, man. But he buys them both their very first milkshake. And they were so excited. They were ecstatic. They had never had had a milkshake before, but they knew it had something to do with ice cream, and they were so stoked. And, and we, we celebrated that. We came home, they shared with mom and dad, and, and we enjoyed that milkshake. But the next morning, in, in my time with the Lord, I was, I was reflecting on just how amazing it is that God ordered our steps, that man, we, God just put it on my heart that I kind of wanted a barbecue sandwich and my wife just kind of wanted a burger and he had me go get barbecue first so then I would come here. So I would just happen to walk in behind this guy and I would just happen to bring my kids with me so they could just happen to experience this. And can I just tell you, there's no greater lesson to a little kid in God's providence than a first milkshake ever. Man, they were, they were so excited. But, but as, I, as I was preparing for the sermon on Saturday, I just thought, man, Christian, what if God wanted to bless you with a metaphorical milkshake every single day? Like, like, like what, if, what if the God of the universe was so ordering your steps that you never took a step, that you never entered into a place that God didn't want you to be? What kind of confidence would that give you? What, what if every single person that you interacted with, you interacted with for a reason? What if God put the people in your path, be it your coworkers or even the people that you run into at restaurants or the grocery store or whatever like that? What if that's divinely orchestrated by your great God to give you an opportunity at sacrificial neighboring to people around you? What could it do if we actually believed in a big God and a big sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent God that actually is ordering everything together and working everything together for his glory and our good like he says that he is. I just wonder for you, how big do you believe that God is? But, but to go a step further, I, I want to ask you a, a second question. How will you personally go and do likewise? What does it look like for you to go and do likewise? You know, I think, I think there's lots of different ways that we can do that. I, th I think this can look a variety of different ways. One of them that I just want to really challenge you in is I, I really want to challenge you to possibly host someone in your home in the next three weeks. I know that's kind of weird, and, and for whatever reason in our culture, I think some of it's due to COVID, some of it's due to what we've been through in the last couple of years, but we are very easily get out of the habit in being hospitable to other people. I wonder if you would take the challenge to host someone in your home, be it a good friend or maybe an actual neighbor that you live next to, or, or, or maybe it's someone at your work that you've been meaning to reach out to for a long time, but I challenge you to think about maybe having someone in your home. 
But also, I want to challenge you to think about this. You know, we're in the season as a, in a, as a church right now where we are asking for people to host small groups. We're about to kick this small group campaign off, and we're asking, man, would God lay it on your heart to potentially host a small group? And I, I challenge you, maybe what it could look like for you to neighbor with people around you, maybe not your immediate neighbors, the people you live closest by, maybe these are your metaphorical neighbors that you do life with, that you, your kids play sports with their kids or maybe you work with them or or maybe your friends at church that you've been here at second for a long time you've just never connected in a small group maybe this could be a great first step in you figuring out what neighboring looks like and I challenge you to do that but but to go even further what does it look like for you to be obedient to go and do likewise you see, what, where, this, where this guy, this, this, this religious leader, where he got it wrong was not in knowing the right answers up here. This guy, he knew the right answers. However, there was a distance from here to here that was too great to be overcome by this man. He couldn't do it. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew what was plaguing this guy was not knowing the right answers. What was plaguing this guy was actually doing what God had given him to do. And I think we deal with the same thing. I think for sometimes for us that are believers, we like to try and make all of these reasons why we're not being obedient to what Jesus has called us to do. All the while, Jesus is calling out to us. He's beckoning us graciously. Hey, would you just go and do likewise? Hey, you, you know the story. Would you go and be like that Samaritan man? Would you love someone sacrificially today? What would it look like for you to love someone sacrificially? So, who is my neighbor? What does it look like for, for me to be a good neighbor to those that are around me? Honestly, I think the better question than who is my neighbor is who isn't your neighbor? Because what we see in this story is that when Jesus is talking about a neighbor, he's not just talking about who lives on your left and on your right. He's not just talking about who is in the closest geographic proximity to you. No, 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 no. What Jesus is talking about when he's talking about your neighbor, he's talking about the people that he sovereignly puts in your path to give you the opportunity to influence them. And my challenge and prayer to us as a church is that we would be obedient as Jesus gives us the opportunity to neighbor well. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we love you so much. God, we're so thankful for today. God, we're thankful that we get to come and we get to worship you. God, thank you for your word. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to be obedient, God, that you would help us to go and do likewise. God, I pray that you would move in the hearts and minds of your people. And God, that we would be a people that are marked by the way that we love others and show hospitality. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.